You got a $2,000 Altair? Yep, ain't it pretty? That wasn't the word that came to mind. It's uh, a little shop-worn. But that's why it was cheap. You know how much Altairs cost? I think about 6,000 bucks or so. Wait, how do you know that? Well, I'm your conscience, you know. I hear stuff. But you should be proud of me, of us. We saved 4,000 bucks. Or another way of looking at it, we wasted 2,000 bucks. I mean, <laughs> look at this disaster. The front panel's all scratched up. It's got the wrong cards, the wrong backplane, the wrong power supply. Wouldn't we be better to just save up six grand and get something, you know, OG? Why pay retail when you can get the same functionality for a discount? Ah, yeah, why order a Gucci watch from Gucci when you can order it from Wish instead? The difference is, this is an Altair, and it's the cheapest one I've seen on eBay in years. 2000 bucks and we can play Kill the Bit and listen to Fool on the Hill, same as all the other Altair guys. There's something awfully appropriate about playing that song on this thing. Oh, why you gotta be such a downer? Because I remember your past $2,000 adventures. Remember that $2,000 Chevy Bel Air? Uh, well... And then that $2,000 Edsel. I was gonna fix that. And the other $2,000 Edsel. But it did run. So did anyone near it. Come to think of it. Wait, what are you doing? Running away. I don't want to be within five miles when you plug that thing in. Ah, what a wimp. I bet you purr like a kitten. Here, let's power you up and show conscience the power of the thrift economy. Uh-oh. Hey, conscience, wait up. <laughs> Yeah, I did a thing again. Well, a thing I did before the thing I did in a previous video. Um, right. A while back, I bought eBay's cheapest Altair. And yeah, it's not perfect, as we'll soon see. But if you're an 8-bit historian like me, it doesn't matter. Quote unquote cheap as it was, this is a real bona fide Altair 8800. The history of the MITS Altair 8800 has been covered in various professional documentaries and countless publications. It's often credited by journalists and such as the first personal computer. I'm sure most of my hardcore vintage computer viewers here know all the details and all the stories about this legendary machine. But just for posterity or for the benefit of those who have no idea what this computer was all about, here's some background. First, let's set something straight. The Altair 8800, contrary to the belief of many, was not the first personal or microcomputer. Actually, it wasn't even the third. There were several microcomputers and or personal computers on the scene before the Altair debuted at the beginning of 1975. Take the microcomputer machine's MCM70, for example, which arrived in 1973. This machine looked like something from 10 years into the future, with a complete keyboard screen and cassette-based storage. All the stuff the Altair didn't have as originally designed. The MCM70 was mainly for scientists though, and ran APL, and it was really expensive and sold in very small numbers. And it was Canadian. So yeah, that's why it doesn't get a lot of glory. As for more personal computers that predated the Altair, well, how about the Mark 8 mini computer, which appeared on the cover of Radio Electronics months before the Altair was announced. Powered by an Intel 8008 running at either 500 or 800 hertz, the Mark 8 was a kit only in the sense that you could order a set of PCBs. You had to find all the other parts all by your damn self. There was no company behind it, just an earnest graduate student in engineering. Apart from support from other hobbyists, you're pretty much on your own with no warranty or guarantee whatsoever. Microinstrumentation and telemetry systems, aka MITS, however, was a real honest-to-goodness manufacturing outfit who could achieve some economies of scale. Its founder and owner, Ed Roberts, knew a thing or two about producing electronics at an affordable price, given his recent experience producing low-cost calculator kits. It was the decline of that business that prompted Roberts to look at the newly invented microcomputer as a way to calm his bankers down. MITS would not just offer a set of plans or maybe a few PCBs in a magazine article, they would provide a complete professionally manufactured kit with all the parts required and excellent documentation to go along with it. They even offered to assemble it for you, if you so desired, for a fee. The quality of their kits would be a step above anything that had come before. Another advantage Altair had over its predecessors was timing. The Altair was introduced just as the new Intel 8080 CPU was hitting the scene. This was an 8-bit, 2 MHz microprocessor that could address up to 64 kilobytes of RAM, making it far more useful than the Intel 8008 to build a practical computer around. Around the same time, Les Solomon, editor of Popular Electronics, have been making noises about wanting to feature a professionally manufactured computer kit in his magazine. The Altair's selection as the cover article for the January 1975 edition no doubt provided a major boost. Once assembled, the Altair 8800 was as basic a computer as you could get. It featured an Intel 8080 running at 2 MHz, as little as 256 bytes of RAM, 
professionally manufactured metal chassis, power supply, and mini computer style front panel with switches and lights. It didn't look anything like what we would think of as a computer today. No keyboard, no monitor, not even a way to save your work. Something that left hobbyists at the tender mercy of their power providers. No. Yes, as originally offered, the Altair was little more than a glorified trainer, a minimal computer designed to teach microcomputer fundamentals. You weren't going to be playing Pong on this thing or typing in an essay. Not that that mattered to hobbyists who were just excited to have a complete computer kit of decent quality to scratch their digital itch. Some hobbyists, upon hearing of the Altair's existence, literally camped outside in Mitz's parking lot for days waiting to receive one. At $439 as a kit, or $621 assembled, the Altair certainly wasn't cheap, but at least it was within the financial reach of the average person. Perhaps the Altair's greatest ace in the hole was the expansion bus it offered, dubbed the Altair bus and later standardized as the S100 bus. It featured 100-pin plug-in slots and ultimately became the first industry-standard expansion bus for a home computer. The CPU, RAM, and later expansion boards were installed as removable cards, which made assembly, repair, and future upgrades easier than on past machines. The Altair bus certainly wasn't a perfect design, but prior to its existence, early computer users had had to work delicately around thickets of wires and install components of their own or someone else's design, praying the whole way that nothing was broken in the process. The Altair bus, on the other hand, required little more than buying and or assembling a card, installing it, and maybe a little bit of tweaking with much less fuss. This undoubtedly helped in the evolution of personal computing from something mainly of interest to those well-versed in electronics and science and into the realm of the general consumer. The Altair bus, coupled with MITS's excellent timing, helped create a cottage industry of third-party hardware providers for the Altair, who, together with MITS, helped transform the Altair from a minimalist trainer into a full-blown practical computer with upgrades like serial boards, video boards, peripheral boards, and so on. It's difficult to overstate the Altair's historical impact. So many hobbyists had their first experiences with programming, games, music, and peripherals on an Altair. Who knows how many future careers in technology began flipping switches on its front panel. Many a computer club meeting was arranged to swap notes, experiment, and support it. Numerous luminaries of the computer industry were inspired by it to take their own leaps of faith into the technology industry. Not too many computers can say they had a hand in the creation of a nearly $3 trillion giant like Microsoft, which owes its success in no small part to the basic they were invited to produce for the Altair. Yes, the Altair 8800 wasn't the first, and no, it wasn't the best computer, but it was the right product at the right time. And its features, timing, and cultural impact secured an important place for itself and its maker in history. Yeah, MITS had started a revolution, but their time in the sun would be short-lived. For like Apple later on with its Apple II and IBM with the 5150 PC, they had created something that was somewhat easily copied. Some of the seeds of the Altair's decline were sown when MITS attempted to create a 4 kilobyte dynamic RAM board for the system. Development problems ensued and a combination of delays and lack of reliability created opportunities for competitors, including those that came up with their own better designed RAM board. Companies that had been producing improvements and peripherals for the Altair soon started coming up with their own complete systems, systems that were better, a little cheaper sometimes, and more reliable. MITS quickly lost control of their invention. The company did produce successors to the Altair, but cash flow was a persistent problem. Competitors were many, and the stress of managing it all was cited by Ed Roberts as a main reason for eventually selling to another technology company called Pertec. Pertec purchased MITS in the hopes of acquiring the rights to Altair Basic, which Roberts' company had spent nearly a million dollars developing after the initial design by Microsoft's Bill Gates and Paul Allen. Roberts felt Altair Basic rightly belonged to MITS and was theirs to sell, but Microsoft argued that they were the rightful owners of the code, and an arbitrator unfortunately agreed. Pertec continued to sell the Altair, but within a few years, both MITS and the Altair name would be retired by Pertec for good. Despite no longer being produced, the Altair was not gone by any means. It was just biding its time, waiting for the moment when historians and collectors like me would begin to give it its due. And that moment is right now. Like many other collectible computer systems, the Altair has a few variations, some worth much more than others. If you're willing to accept some trade-offs, you can collect rare machines like this somewhat affordably. Anyway, let's take a look at the different versions of Altairs out there. Now, I should be careful here, I am not an expert per se on MITS or its products. 
What I do know has been gleaned from research and observation of many auctions over the years involving MIT's products. So take what I say with a healthy grain of salt and feel free to correct me in the comments. I don't think anyone really has a complete picture on Altair production, and MITs were not always consistent in what parts they used from system to system later on, so you have to approach buying one with caution and a sharp eye. The very first Altair 8800 model is what's known to collectors as the Rev Zero. Just like the Apple II Rev Zero, it is called such because it's the original product before any changes happened. Okay, technically, perhaps the Rev Zero is more like a Rev One, as it is actually not the first original design MITs proposed and prototyped. The original was a compact, stacked pile of boards with no Altair bus connectors in sight. I'm not sure if this design made it into the legendary prototype, which was shipped to Les Solomon for testing and inclusion into popular electronics. The prototype fell victim to a mail strike in 1974 and was lost in transit, and there just aren't any pictures of it out there. The unit that appeared on popular electronics' cover was just a hollow box. But as far as I know, all future prototypes and production machines followed the more familiar design that we know with the horizontal backplane that individual cards plugged into. The Rev Zero is the machine that collectors covet most, and that's typically how it is in collecting. People usually like the very first original thing as it was delivered by the manufacturer. And in good condition, an Altair can fetch easily north of $6,000 or more. There's one machine I'm pretty sure was worth more than 6,000 bucks, formerly owned by Craig Solomonson. If you want to see what one of the very first Altair 8800s off the production line looked like, check out this video by Craig. In it, he shows off a machine with serial number 5. You don't get much more original or basic or lower serial number than this. Like Craig's, most Altairs have a sticker number at the back, although some doubtless have fallen off, and some collectors actually didn't bother to affix it to their machines in the first place. Like many companies, MITS opted not to start their serial numbering scheme at number 1. The serial numbers are six digits starting with 22, the rest being the sequential number of the machine. Or at least I think it is. It's a bit confusing because while significant changes to Altair hardware broadly align with increases in serial numbers, I've occasionally seen later machines like the Altair 8800A with very low serial numbers. Perhaps those machines were upgraded, or maybe the numbers aren't truly sequential. I'm not sure. Anyway, Craig's machine, if we can trust the earliest serial numbers, is 220005. And in his video, he says that makes it the fifth built, so <laughs> that's pretty darn early. Add to the fact that the serial number was suffixed with an A, meaning it was assembled by the factory, and that makes it even rarer. Actually, you can kind of tell this machine was built by the factory just by how neat and tidy the wiring and everything is. Even the front panel on this very early machine differs from most of the rest. Note how the silk screening has a straight line from the sense switch text through seven address switches. This design seems to have persisted through at least 1600 units. Later Altairs like mine have a diagonal line that connects with another line underneath. As far as I've been able to determine, most Altairs were actually sold as kits and their serial numbers are suffixed with K. Given that it costs 50% more to have an Altair assembled by MITS, or around $1,150 in today's money, it's understandable that a lot of people opted to go the kit route. However, like many projects requiring lots of time, persistence, attention to detail, and skill, many Altair kits never reached a working state. A co-owner of a computer store in Atlanta that sold Altair kits, Ron Roberts, no relation to Ed, was quoted by the Atlanta Journal saying kit building, quote, wasn't for the faint of heart. Even if you succeeded in putting an Altair together, chances are it wouldn't work. Roberts went on to estimate that something like two-thirds of all kit-built Altairs sold by his store were never finished, or were but simply didn't operate. And that tracks with the smattering of kit parts that I bought way back when. Clearly someone started the project and then abruptly stopped for some unknown reason, perhaps lack of interest or a better product that came out later on. Mitz's manuals were generally excellent, but with something this complex, it was pretty easy to make costly mistakes. If the overall failure rate was anywhere near as high as what Ron Roberts suggested, that could help explain today's scarcity of Altairs and buttress higher prices. There's a lot of empty space inside a stock Altair. The basic machine only really needed the RAM and CPU cards to be functional. Craig's, however, had an extra RAM board as well as a serial board. One negative aspect of the original Altair, though, was its power supply. This mess of transformers and caps were known to be rather weak. While present day collectors insist on its presence for originalness, many contemporary users were only too happy to upgrade if they got the chance, especially if they were adding multiple boards to their system. And if they did, that does take away some dollars on auction value today. 
The Rev Zero Altera's cards are distinctive. Apart from having Rev Zero etched right onto the PCB, their silk screening is done in yellow. Later revisions of the Altair cards had black silk screening. I've done some of my own research watching sales on eBay, and it seems like there are roughly around 3,000 or less Rev Zero machines. Somewhere near or after serial number 223000, MITS released the Rev 1, which was essentially the same machine, except the cards were made thicker to reduce warpage, along with some minor tweaks to fix bugs in the foil patterns. So, Rev 1s really were a minor tweak compared to the Rev 0, although collectors draw a bright red line between them on value. These machines typically fetch three or four thousand dollars in good condition. However, after the Rev 1, the Altair did begin to change substantially. The Altair 8800A, which appeared, I think, somewhere around serial number 5000, featured a revised front panel badge, as well as a larger backplane, rather than relying on individual four-slot backplanes that had to be wired together as you expand it. The power supply was also revised to a stronger, single transformer design, and sometimes the front panel switches are flat and paddle-shaped. 8800A prices fluctuate a lot depending on condition. I've often seen them go for well under $2,000. After the 8800A came the 8800B, which featured an all-new front panel with paddle-style switches, an 18-slot backplane, and redesigned CPU card with new Intel chipset. It also came with a serial card, something the original 8800 forced the user to buy separately. The 8800B definitely has its fans, and I've seen them fetch a bit more than the 8800A, often over $2,000. People really seem to like the revised front panel design. The 8800B was followed by the 8800B Turnkey. This was a significant departure from the original, as it eliminated the whole blinky lights and switches front panel paradigm in favor of a literal turnable key on the front. The turnkey had a special card called, wait for it, the turnkey card, that contained boot ROMs for the machine, so all you had to do was hook up a terminal and disk drive and go. Some contemporary hobbyists scorned this machine, calling it the turkey, because they didn't like the lack of a front panel. Today's collectors also seem to agree, at auction, the turnkey fetches much less money than a Rev Zero Altair or even an Altair 8800A, and in recent years I've seen a bunch go for less than $1,000. There was also an Altair variant known as the 8800B Turnkey Foley Edition, so named because it was sold through a department store chain called Foley's. For this unit, the Altair chassis was modified to hold one or two mini-disc floppy drives. I've only seen a couple of these come up for sale, and there's no stable price for them. I've seen them go for upwards of two grand though. If I had my druthers, I'd probably own every model made. But this isn't a perfect world and resources are scarce, so I've focused my attention on the original pre-8800A Altair. Of course I'd love to own a pristine, low serial number Rev Zero Altair, but uh, <laughs> I also like to eat. A couple of years ago, I stumbled on an estate sale offering on eBay. It was for several pieces of an Altair 8800, although not nearly all of it. From what I could see, it appeared to be bits of a low serial Rev Zero Altair with early version of the manual, a Rev Zero CPU, and a front panel card, outer cover, and some unopened packages of MIT's famous angel hair white wire. I made what I thought was a lowball offer because Altairs are pretty popular and expensive, and I got it. Turns out I should have offered a lot less. Anyway, it appeared the original owner briefly started the construction process and then for some reason or other stopped, and the rest of the parts were lost to time. But it was a way for me to get my hands on actual Altair stuff, so when it arrived I felt like I was touching the holy grail. I then put out an appeal to viewers in case they might have some spare parts for Altairs lying around, particularly the internal chassis. And one viewer sprung into action, he had a complete Altair 8800B internal chassis with backplane and power supply unit he offered for a very reasonable price. Bet I jumped on that. But for the next two years I was stymied. Although Altair 8800 parts do show up on eBay from time to time, they are few and far between, and over time their prices have risen along with complete systems. One component I really needed was the front dress panel, with all the switch labelings and stuff. The literal face of the Altair. But in two years of looking, only one of those ever showed up, and of course, eBay being eBay, it went for several hundred bucks. Also, during that time, I never saw an original Altair power supply come up for sale, and the original backplane? <laughs> well, let's just say some sellers are kind of out there. So, along comes one particular Christmas, and behold, this baby shows up. Interestingly, the Christmas holiday can actually be a pretty good time for deals on eBay. I think part of it is potential bidders being exhausted from their Christmas spending and too busy with holiday stuff to partake. 
One Christmas holiday, I scored a complete SWIT PC 6800 system with TV Typewriter 2 terminal, AC30 cassette interface, and manual for less than any one of those components would have sold for individually. This Altair 8800 was complete and possibly functional, but there were some big caveats. For one, it was missing the famous 8800 label on the front. Some hobbyists didn't bother with those, but collectors seemed to prefer to have them. Second, it had an aftermarket backplane. Third, it had an aftermarket power supply. In terms of original Altair parts, it definitely was a bit of a mixed bag. The front panel was a Rev 1, while the CPU and RAM cards were both Rev 0. I asked the seller about this and he told me that he had had a Rev 0 machine also, and for some reason or other swapped in the CPU and RAM card from that into this Rev 1 machine and then did something else with the original Rev 1 card. And that's okay, contemporaneous users of the Altair did part swaps all the time. The point is, for my cheapskate eyes, it's fine just like it is. It was listed the week of Christmas, there was only one bid on it, and I figured, what the hell? Counting on the exhaustion of Christmas shopping, I put in a lowball bid via Gixon and I left it. If it was going to go for much more than that, eh, I simply couldn't afford it. Anyway, the auction ended, my snipe bid went off, and no other snipe bids. Fantastic! I had just bought the cheapest Altair I'd seen on eBay in at least five years. I can't tell you how cool it is to finally have this machine in my possession. For so long I was only able to look at it in pictures or other people's videos because of the insane prices they fetched. It's so weird seeing an actual Altair on my desk after years of just reading and thinking about owning one. It's so iconic. Okay, so it's not completely original spec, but who cares? This is a real Altair front panel, a real Altair case, and there's a real Altair CPU and RAM card inside. That's the true Altair. Everything else is not that important to me. Now, while I was hunting for parts for my 8800, a really awesome fellow hobbyist reached out to me and offered me an Altair front panel badge. It was unused, near mint condition, except for a dent in the end. So yeah, that's going on this beast right now. There we go. Now we're legit. Okay, so let's have a look at the actual hardware. Externally, this Altair checks off all the boxes. There's nothing here that isn't legit mitts. We can see the serial number is just a wee bit over that 3000-ish border between Rev0 and Rev1. However, as I said before, Altair serials are not 100% indicative of what the hardware should be inside. I've seen Rev0 parts in machines with higher serial numbers, and I've seen Rev1 parts in machines with lower serial numbers. Like most companies, MITS was pragmatic about clearing its parts inventories. The inside is nice and tidy, and we can see right away how the previous owner dispensed with MITS's much weaker power supply. The original power supply featured three different transformers and a PCB that hosted a whole bunch of axial capacitors. This arrangement worked, but just barely, and as serious Altair users began using their machines as honest-to-goodness computers, especially with multiple expansions, the limitations of the original power supply became painfully obvious. I can't say for sure if the original supply was ever here. I note in the manual, while the builder did check off various boxes during the construction process elsewhere, the section covering the power supply is devoid of any of that. It's quite possible by now users were wise to the 8800 power supply's failings, and opted to omit that and create their own. Yeah, this one is seriously beefy. The box of big capacitors here makes me think of a really well-constructed bomb. The backplane board here I don't think is original mitts either. It's nine slots and I don't see any manufacturer markings. You can see that the mitts units were quite a bit wider than what's in my machine and have more holes drilled for card guides and such. There might be manufacturer markings underneath, but I'm not messing with this right now. When I got the machine, a few wires had been broken off on both the front panel and front panel connector, and it seemed pretty obvious where they'd come from, so I resoldered those. The seller informed me that the beefier power supply puts out plus 10 volts instead of plus 8 volts on one of the rails, and thus the regulator on the CPU board had to be modified with a long heatsink to dissipate the extra heat as it was brought down to 5 volts. He also added a large fan at the back, which makes the occasional disturbing noises. The CPU card is an authentic Rev0 card. These sell for over 600 bucks on eBay, unless they're sold by me. Yeah, I guess I should mention, to help finance this, I kind of sold off some of the parts from my kit parts, including my unfinished Rev0 CPU card. It went for much less than I expected, and yeah, I didn't expect it to go for full pop since it was missing the CPU, but still a few hundred would have been nice. There does seem to be a penalty also from selling outside the US. 
Another thing I sold off was the original RAM card, and I regret this because it had the full 1K installed. There's kind of a weird inverse relationship with these cards between the value and the amount of RAM installed. The less original RAM installed, the more they seem to go for. Yeah, I don't get it either. I guess some collectors figure that if there's less RAM on there, that means the board was earlier, since RAM was much more expensive at the beginning of the Altair's existence. Anyway, the top end price for these is about 600 bucks. I only got 100-ish for mine though. Hmm. This card was missing a RAM chip, which the owner removed because it was bad. These are 256K by 4-bit RAM chips, so you need to have them installed in pairs. Since I was missing one, I removed the chip it was paired with also. That brings us down to 768 bytes, I think. Yay. But, you know, that's still a little bit more than what the typical first-generation Altair user had. Okay, so let's put things back together here, and then we'll take it for a test spin. I haven't really tested this thing full on. After repairing wires and verifying that it didn't immediately burn with the application power, I put it away and moved on to other things. But today we're going to push our luck a bit and see what it was like to program an Altair off the front panel. I want to stress here, I am not and have never presented myself as an expert, and I may be wrong on some of what follows. Actually, since this is me we're talking about, there's absolutely going to be some things I get wrong. I don't program, and I only know enough hardware-wise to get myself into, and sometimes out of trouble. So I'll just give a brief overview of the front panel operation, and then start entering programs. To get a much more in-depth and accurate look at Altair 8800 use, I very strongly recommend you check out my VC friend DRAMP5113's channel, which goes into Altair 8800 operation in much greater detail, and shows some really interesting use situations like Altair Basic with a teletype. So here's the Altair 8800 front panel, and it is kind of intimidating looking. The Altair is in some ways to modern computers like the Model T is to modern cars. They both do more or less the same thing, but each are operated very differently. Longtime viewers of the channel might remember a video I produced about the OSI 300 trainer board. That machine also had a front panel, however with OSI the data and address switches were set up to correspond with binary numbers. That's because the OSI machine only had a measly 128 bytes of RAM, so the complexity of programs were very limited. However, for the Altair, a user could configure their machine with a kilobyte or even more. That makes binary switches and lights impractical. So MITS kind of borrowed from earlier mini computer and mainframe panels and went with Octal. Octal is a base 8 numeral system. Rather than going from 1 to 10 as in decimal, Octal's lowest digit is 0 and the highest digit is 7. With respect to computers, a word is a unit of data used by a certain processor design. For machines that had word sizes divisible by 3, i.e. 6, 12, 24, or 36-bit words, octal was convenient since each octal digit could represent three binary digits. So 2, 4, or 12 octal digits could display an entire machine word in a compact way. The Intel 8080 microprocessor uses 8-bit words, so octal is a little less than ideal here. All of the data and address lights represent octal digits, which can be confusing if you're like me and are used to binary switches and indicator lights. I think Ed Roberts designed the Altair to use Octal just out of familiarity more than anything else. Anyway, on the Altair front panel, we just have a single row of dual purpose switches for address and data entry. So you have to be kind of attentive to which function you're trying to do while setting them. The highest octal number used on the Altair is 377, which is equivalent to binary 11111111, the highest value for an 8-bit byte of data. Thus, the Altair uses only 8 switches for entering data rather than 9. The other switches are typically used for memory addressing, although on a basic 256-byte Altair, you didn't really need them. Some of the switches are what are called sense switches. These eight switches, which you can see are grouped together by the silk screen, can actually be read and used as an input device with running programs, which we'll demonstrate later. On many vintage Altairs, you'll often see colored plastic boots put onto the ends of the Altair switches to make it easier to group them together for different functions. On the bottom of the front panel, we have the power switch, a switch that tells the computer to run programs or stop running a program, a switch that allows us to step through instructions one memory cycle at a time, a switch that allows us to examine the contents of a selected memory address, or examine the contents of the next memory address, a switch that allows us to deposit data to the current memory address, or deposit it to the next address, a switch that allows us to reset the CPU, a switch that protects RAM from being overwritten if the memory board supports it, and then finally two auxiliary switches which were almost never used. The data and memory LEDs as I mentioned are grouped in threes. 
except for the data LEDs, which have only eight. There's also several LEDs that indicate the status of the machine and various things like if memory protect mode is activated. Again, I'm not gonna dive in too deep with these as other people like DRAMP explain these functions much better than I can. Data entry is pretty simple. You can choose the memory address you wanna to go to first and then hit examine to go there. Then you can set the data switches to the octal value representing the byte you wanna deposit and flip up the deposit switch. The difference between deposit and deposit next, as mentioned, is deposit places the data into the memory address you're at now, whereas deposit next puts the data in the next address up from where you currently are. In many programming situations when you're starting from scratch, you usually will reset to go to address zero, choose the data you want to put there, which would be an instruction for the CPU typically, and then hit deposit. Then you would put in the next byte of data and hit deposit next to deposit that data into memory address one. And then typically a programmer would just keep entering new data values and hitting deposit next until done, unless they needed to go to a specific address that wasn't immediately above the one that they were working on for their next entry. So for a little test drive here, we're gonna do a basic addition program, which will take the contents of two memory locations, add them together, and then store the result at a location in memory we specify. This is provided from the Altair's own manual, which contains several small example programs like these to familiarize the user with entering and examining data and make the computer actually do something. One thing I'd like to note about the Altair manual is just how detailed it is. The manual doesn't assume you're an electronics engineer and provides plenty of background in a language that most can understand. It even gets into the history of logic, how binary works, and so on. It's a cut above what passes for a manual nowadays. Looking at our program here, we can see that they're showing something called a bit pattern. This pattern physically aligns with the data switches on the Altair's front panel. The manual could just give us the octal numbers, but this is written for beginners, so they're basically showing us what pattern of switches would equal the octal number we're seeking. In this case, 00111010 is equivalent to octal 72. I think MITS is just trying not to overwhelm the first time user with math in the first two pages of their guide. All right, so let's have a look at our program here and see what it does exactly. Essentially, we are loading the accumulator with the contents of memory address 128. Why 128? Uh, no particular reason, it's just an arbitrary location MITS has chosen for this demo program that isn't smack in the middle of the program itself. The contents of 128 are the first number to be added. Next, we move the accumulator to register B. We then load the accumulator with the contents of memory address 129, this being the second number which is to be added to the first. In the next instruction, the computer must add register B to the accumulator, which has the effect of adding the two numbers together. Next, we store the result at a third memory location, 130. And then finally, we'd have the CPU just jump back to the first instruction of the program. To fetch our addition result, we have to manually stop the computer program from running and then examine memory address 130 to get the result. All right, let's hit it. First, I power the machine up. No explosions, always grateful for that. Next, we do a full reset. As you can see, we're at address zero because none of the address lights are lit up. This may be confusing for beginners because note there's an address indicator light that says A0, which the average person might think should be lit since we're at address zero. Nope, that's octal, and if that light were lit, we'd be at address one, as you'll soon see. Okay, so first bit pattern, starting at address zero, is 00111010, which is the instruction to load the accumulator. The next bit pattern tells the computer where to find the data to load into said accumulator. The next bit pattern is all zeros because two bytes are required for the entry of memory addresses. Since we're not working with any memory addresses above octal 377, we just leave the second byte at zero. Next, we tell the Altera to move the accumulator to register B. Now we load that register. with the contents of memory address 129, which is octal 201. And again, the second byte is zero. Now we tell the machine to add register B to the accumulator. Next, we store the accumulator contents. at memory address 130, which is octal 202. Again, zeros for the second byte. And now we issue a jump command. Back to address zero. And again, all zeros for the second byte. Okay, so now I'm gonna verify I entered everything correctly. 
I'll return all the switches to zero and then hit examine to check the contents there. Yep, matches what the bit pattern should be here. Now I'll examine next and yeah, we'll just keep checking along here. That's good. That's good. Also good. Very good. 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 Very good. Excellent. Exactly. Awesome. Flawless. Okay, program is good to go. Now let's give it some numbers to work with. First I'll go to address 128. And for now I'll keep it simple and choose the number 1. That'll be the first number to add. Bear in mind this is all in octal, but octal digits and decimal digits are the same up to 7. I'll just leave the data switches as they are and hit deposit next to deposit 1 to memory address 129, which is the next location for our data to be added, and that will be the second number to be added together with the first. Alright, time to do some math. Here I hit the run switch, and yeah, it's just basically continuously adding 1 and 1 here. And I kind of do that myself sometimes. The manual says to wait a little bit, but really this should be done almost instantaneously given how small the program is. And now we'll stop it. Now to check address 130 to see what our result was. And check it out, we have a 2. Awesome, so this is sort of working. I'm going to change the contents at 128 and 129 here, and just try adding different numbers. Uh oh, I just spotted a problem as I'm editing here. Now, remember I said to keep your wits about you with these dual purpose address and data entry switches? Well, here's exhibit A. While I was filming the input of 2 and 3 to be added, I didn't clue in that I had accidentally left the A7 slash D7 switch up, which was left over from when I went to examine address 202 or decimal 130. So, when I thought I was entering an octal 002, I was actually inadvertently entering octal 202, likewise for 3. Because the machine came up with the result of octal 005, I mistakenly thought everything had worked. However, as you know, the maximum value that can be represented in an 8-bit byte is 255, or 377 octal, which is why the leftmost set of data switches only have two switches rather than three. Since the result of adding octal 202 and 203 results in octal 405, we have a problem because that's a higher value than the Altair can store in a single byte of data. I'm told this should roll the result over to zero, but it looks like in our case the Altair just added the 2 and 3 and came up with octal 005, which kind of fooled me. Dope. Anyway, let's try this again. Uh, this time I'll add octal 4 and 3 and I'll make sure I don't accidentally leave the A7 slash D7 switch up. And we'll run it. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so yeah, this Altair is definitely working, despite the monkey operating it not working very well. This is a valuable lesson in paying close attention to what you're doing. Okay, for our next trick, we'll do something a bit more advanced. This is something that comes as close to an arcade game as you can get on the original vanilla Altair. Created by Dean McDaniel in 1975, Kill the Bit causes several address indicator lights to flash in sequence. This is where the sense switches become useful. Your goal is to flip one of the sense switches up and down just as the light directly above it illuminates, causing the moving LED bit to go dark. This is how you kill the bit. If you miss, the program adds more bits, aka LEDs, that you now have to kill. Now, I'll run through it here, and again, I get tripped up by switch panel confusion a lot. In another 20 minute knot tying, I goofed on entering 010 octal at two memory locations. I accidentally read it as the bit pattern as I'd seen in the Altair manual, rather than actually octal 010, which is the number 2. So by accident, I'd set the first two switches to 0, the second set to 2, and the final 3 to 0, when in fact they should have been 00001000. Oops. Anyway, with that corrected, at last I can run the program, and it works. It's not super fast here, so it's fairly easy to beat, but still, it's pretty amazing Dean pulled this off at all given how limited the front panel interface is. Now, to turn up the heat a little bit more here, I'm going to increase the speed by increasing the value in memory location 6. And we'll run it. Wow, yeah, that's way faster. Uh, I'm actually having trouble now. Uh, yeah, it's just pure luck that I'm able to stop it. All right, well that's the famous Kill the Bit program by Dean McDaniel. Now, there is one more really famous Altair program I've always wanted to try in person. This one involves music. 
Yep, that's right, music. No, the Altair doesn't have a speaker or anything approaching a sound card. The music is achieved in kind of a roundabout way. The story goes that a member of the homebrew computer club, Steve Dompier, discovered by accident that the Altair could produce a kind of music with the help of a portable radio. Steve was a very enthusiastic and early Altair user, such that 30 hours after his arrived in the mail, he had it built and running. Anyway, Steve said he had his Altair program to do some sort of sorting program, and while running the program was listening to a weather broadcast on a transistor radio he had on hand. Steve noticed that when the Altair was running, he could hear different tones as interference on the radio. He then got curious and decided to see if the tones changed with different programs, and spent hours toggling in other programs to see what notes they produced. After figuring out how different operations created different notes, he wrote his own program to purposely try to control and manipulate the tones, writing what is probably the very first program to create music on a personal computer. Looking for examples to demonstrate his program, Steve picked The Fool on the Hill by The Beatles. When he played it for assembled members of the Bay Area Amateur Users Group and Homebrew Computer Club, they were astonished. It seems like the radio was pretty much the first peripheral used with a personal computer. Anyway, that's the story, and I've always wanted to try it out in real life. Now, with an actual Altair on my desk, I figured, what the heck? One thing I don't have hanging around in abundance are portable radios. To be honest, sitting here in 2023, I can't remember the last time I actually listened to a radio at all. Usually in my car, I have my music playing via Bluetooth from my phone. In fact, the closest thing I have to a portable radio is my ancient bedside alarm clock radio here. And after many years of neglect, the radio portion's a little touchy. So here's the thing, I went ahead and entered the program, which on these switches takes a fair amount of time, like upwards of 25 minutes. However, at the end, I had no music. I fiddled and faddled around, but no dice. At one point, I could kind of hear something like a computer tone if I kind of just twisted the dial a little bit towards certain stations, but it wasn't changing. So what was going on? Well, at first I thought it maybe was just my crappy radio, but the next day after talking to the helpful folks on the VC Fed forums, I realized I'd missed something critically important in entering the data into the Altair, and this was compounded by a mistake in the comments for the program. Note here where Steve's notes say, be sure to load the starting address into H and L at address two and three. Well, that caused immediate confusion because reading the program listing on the left side, the starting address was to be loaded into memory locations 1 and 2. After confirming this error, I then made an even bigger error. You see, despite my valiant attempts at this thing called reading, I had read how the Altair deposited memory contents wrong. I thought to start programming from scratch, you did a reset and then just started entering the contents of the first memory address and toggled deposit next. Nope. When starting at memory address 0, you hit deposit, not deposit next. Then you toggle in the memory contents for address 001 and then hit deposit next. Deposit next always puts whatever data you've specified into the next address. There's no way to use deposit next with address 0 because there's nothing before it. I had misread the function of the deposit next in my brain as it deposits at the memory address you're at first and then carries on depositing to each subsequent address. Because of this mistake, I wrongly believe the program listing was incorrect and that Steve's comments were correct, because since I was always hitting deposit next for the first memory address, it was always depositing a memory location 001. In other words, I didn't think there was an actual memory location 0. So I foolishly altered the program listing to match what I thought should be happening with the Altair and <laughs> wasted 25 minutes and that's why I had no music. Anyway, the next morning, suitably chastened, I restored the program to its original correct listing. I also decided to sub in my mom and dad's old stereo deck for on the radio end because its AM radio functions work better and the tuner had more finite adjustments than my bedside clock. And because the radio in my Toyota might be tricky to get into the house. Alright, a little bit of static here. Uh, oh, there it is. It's working. It's actually working.
That is so cool. This is something I've only ever read about before or seen in other people's videos. It's really cool to have this actually running on my desk here with real hardware. That is awesome. There is some heavy interference, but that might be the monster power supply in this thing. But uh, yeah, you can clearly hear the tones and you can sort of make out fool on the hill in places. It's running a little fast and there's some notes that I don't recognize, but uh, yeah, I, I didn't put in, I think, the correct tempo, so it might be just sort of off a little bit. But man, yeah, that is just, you know, 50 years after this was first demonstrated, here it is on my desk. This is the kind of thing that brings history truly to life. You can just imagine what it must have felt like to be sitting in the auditorium where they held the homebrew computer club meetings and how the assembled hobbyists felt hearing music on a personal computer for the first time, along with all the other firsts they were stumbling into with this new machine that hadn't even been possible to own a few years ago. Actually, you don't have to imagine it really. According to Steve, the homebrew computer club audience, upon hearing this digital music, demanded an encore. Wow, what a truly unique and historic machine the Altair is. I'm so grateful to have one now. Okay, so now to other business. What am I doing with the remains of what was supposed to be my built from pieces Altair? Well, as you may be aware, the chassis that I bought to go with my Rev Zero kit parts comes from an Altair 8800B turnkey. The outer cover obviously came from an earlier Altair, but it was exactly the same for the turnkey version, so that doesn't really matter. Last year I picked up the Altair turnkey controller card, which is crucial if you want to use this thing as an actual turnkey machine. And I think that's my plan for now. I'm going to just collect pieces and hopefully restore this bag of bones back to an Altair 8800B turnkey, which is an interesting machine in its own right. And yeah, I know that presents a lot of the same problems as the original 8800, especially the front panel, but the difference is I've actually seen various turnkey components come up on eBay before in some quantity, and since it's a less desirable version of the Altair, the prices are accordingly lower, usually. So there's some hope of getting it done, although it may be derailed if I come across another Altair 8800B turnkey on eBay that's complete and at a much cheaper price than all the parts individually would cost to purchase. I'm not quite as enthusiastic about the turnkey, obviously, as I am about the original Altair, so I can wait as long as required to get all those parts together. I've actually had success with this strategy before. I recently rebuilt a polymorphic Poly88, which I originally acquired as an empty case this way, and I'm currently doing something similar with a Poly 8813. Even if the buy it in pieces method isn't cheaper than actually buying a complete unit, it sometimes allows you to kind of spread out the cost a little bit. So yeah, that's kind of the plan. In terms of future plans for this Altair 8800, I will probably try and find a serial board for it so I can hook it up to my teletype and experience the earliest versions of Microsoft, uh, I mean Altair basic, but that'll be another day. I don't think I'm going to do too much else to this machine. I mean, I could, if I find the original parts, uh, restore the original backplane and power supply to make it somewhat official again, but uh, I'm not really too worried about that. It's more just having the thing that looks like the thing and has the same functionality and the heart of it is still a real Altair. That's all that really matters. Anyway, thanks so much for watching this video. If you like what you've seen, smash that like button. If not, hit the dislike button. I can handle it, I promise. <laughs> And if you're really enthusiastic, please consider subscribing or becoming a patron. Patrons receive early versions of my videos as well as exclusive behind the scenes content and will receive other stuff I dream up as I go. Anyway, thanks so much for watching and we'll see you again very soon.